what ends up happening, what ends up happening in the lumbar spine with this uh, disc. Um, several reports on the link charité. The original studies, 250 patients. Uh, David has been the main investigator of it. Two reports, 60 to 85 percent excellent good results, 10 to 16 percent poor. Um, 14 patients with 10-year follow-up. There was no loosening and no polyethylene wear. This has been found in the ProDisc as well. Clearly different than hips and knees. We don't wear the polyethylene in the lumbar spine or the cervical spine. It's a different joint, doesn't have the forces. There's no synovial membrane, and that probably has a lot to do with why the polyethylene is not wearing. A lot of people think, well, when are we going to have to go back and change that poly? Uh, European follow-ups, 15 to 16 years, they haven't had to go back, and the wear on it is very minimal. And I'll show you some biomechanical studies on that as well. SB Charity studies, uh, they did a two-to-one randomization with the U.S. trial. Two discs for every one fusion. It was randomized against a BAK fusion. This also was part of a problem for them in that uh, BAK fusions have been difficult to document whether they're fused or not, and they're having a little trouble analyzing that study because of the BAK. The ProDisc has been randomized against a 360 fusion, so you can pretty much guarantee yourself a, a fusion. Single level only, 400 patients. Uh, so they've had about 250 discs, the rest fusions. The aroma was completed in 2002. They're now in their waiting period. The ProDisc, three-part also, semi-constrained. Got cobalt chrome with the uh, keel, uh, ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene for the core, and then it has the plasma titanium, uh, or the porous titanium plasma spray coating for the bone interface. The Link Charité simply had a smooth, uh, cobalt chrome surface. Here it is. There's the uh, keel on top and bottom that locks it into position. Here's the uh, porous ingrowth inlay. Range of motion testing uh, is virtually, here's normal, here's with the pro disc. Very similar, it's unconstrained in rotation. Uh, provides load sharing, and here's the difference between the Link Charité and the ProDisc. It is the load sharing. When you load your facets, either in this direction, you shear, and that shear without constraint causes your facets to bang up against each other, and this is where you wear them out. Now, with the, the uh, ProDisc, you uh, protect those facets because those forces are shared with the collateral structure and the inlay there it does not allow it to bang your facets. And actually, we have found that we've expanded the indications with the ProDisc and start doing it on people with laminectomies and facet, uh, some facet disease, and they do not get the facet pain. With the Link Charity, they've had to be very careful to have absolutely virginal uh, facets and do facet injections before they were to put it in. Not the case with the ProDisc. We're able to extend those indications. Been a lot of mechanical testing done, uh, typical. Uh, testing and fatigue creep. Wear testing here is where I think we should focus on. It's been wear tested up to 14 million cycles. Typical three axis load and biomechanical testing uh, in bovine serum. At, and at 14 million cycles, all you need to focus on right here. In the knee world or the hip world, if you have a hip with polyethylene, the wear rates are 35 million or milligrams per million cycles. In the lumbar disc, in the pro disc, it's only 4.23. A tenfold decrease in the amount of wear on the polyethylene in the lumbar spine. Not sure we entirely understand that, other than, again, there's no synovial membrane and the forces are clearly different, not the impact uh, forces that cause a lot of debris. So very little wear on the polyethylene in the lumbar discs. Typical uh, studies, this is L5S1, AP lateral. Two level diseases, uh, we've been, a, we have uh, almost as many t in our study, I have about 100 patients in this study at, at our center, and we have almost as many two levels as we do single levels. There's no difference in the outcome, single level versus double level. And in Europe, uh, they have three and four level cases. This is from Rudy Bertignoli. This happens to be uh, Marnier, the creator of the ProDisc. It happens to be his father-in-law, who's a 55-year-old saxophone player uh, with a three-level artificial disc replacement. Here's going to be, I think, one of our great uses for this. Uh, we're not allowed to do this in the U.S., although I had, it, had, a, 
had the uh, case where we had a four to one fusion, very rapidly degenerated in a 35 year old and I wrote to the FDA and they gave a, gave a special dispensation to put in an artificial disc above a fusion. I think we're gonna see, all of us are seeing degeneration above our solid fusions and this probably will be uh, one of our mainstays to take care of this will be the artificial disc. I only have two of these patients, but it's quite commonly performed in Europe. And you're able to skip levels as well and leave a normal level. This would be tough to do if you fuse this level and fuse this level, you pretty rapidly degenerate that level, not occurring with the artificial disc. The ProDisc was developed by Terry Marnier in Montpellier, France, first produced in 1989. Uh, he, jo he joined with a Paris surgeon and for a three-year period, they took 64 patients and put in 93 discs, and then they stopped. Uh, remember, uh, was a, primarily a scoliosis surgeon and had gone through all the implants with scoliosis and some of the failures of Harrington rods, so they stopped to see what's going to happen with this artificial disc. <clears throat> Ten-year clinical history came from uh, Spine Solutions, under, undertook a retrospective study in the year 2000. Located patients collected under protocol, radiographs, flexion extension, and CT scans on all of these patients that were done in 90 to 93. They did uh, visual analog scores and oswestry, SF36, and physical exam uh, independently on all these patients. X-rays were done extensively, and I've actually been through these uh, 60 patients with these CAT scans, etc., to see if there was still motion at 10 to 13 years later. 64 patients, three uh, had died over the, that uh, 10 to 12 year period. 61 were available for follow up. 58 were located and evaluated. This was a pretty incredible story to go all throughout Europe and multiple countries and get 58 of these 64 patients. A 95% follow up rate. Um, 39 one levels, 21 two levels, and four three levels. Average follow up 10 years. At 10 years, all implants were intact and functioning, no evidence of subsidence or migration, no revisions, removals, or device failures, no detectable polyethylene wear. This data was then taken to the FDA and this is what allowed the FDA to okay and begin the IDE study. Basically 92.7% of patients were satisfied or entirely satisfied and this proved that it was fundamentally safe and showed the preliminary efficacy for the FDA to allow the study. Here was the visual analog scores, preoperatively 8.6 for back pain, dramatically decreased postoperatively 3.2, leg pain 7.1 versus 2.1, and again, 10-year follow-up. Uh, bottom line, 92.7% satisfaction for treatment of low back pain with 10-year follow-up. And no, no failed implants, no migration, no subsidence. Uh, there were subsequently five posterior fusions of those 64 patients. IDE approval came uh, July 27, 2001. It's a, it was a randomized perspective controlled study. Again, two pro disc for every control, and the control is a anterior posterior fusion, allograft in the front, pedicle screws, and iliac crest bone graft in the back. 255 patients per arm, single level and double level, and a minimum two year follow up. And again, for FDA studies, equivalency has to be shown, not superiority. You have to show that it's equivoc equivocal not equivocal, but equivalent to the uh, fusions. Uh, one and two level adjacent, and we're only able to do it L3 or below. Uh, back or leg pain have to have all the appropriate studies. The age limit is 60 maximum, start at 18. And this is primarily set because of osteoporosis. They didn't want to get into uh, osteoporotic patients at this point in time. Had to have had six months of conservative care. Oswestry score has to be at least 20 out of 50 and able to complete the uh, protocol. Um, for a protest to be successful, it has to have a 15% improvement in oswestry, maintain or improve motion, uh, similar for a uh, fusion to be successful, 15% improvement in the oswestry score. Here's an interoperative picture of the pro disc, and these are done, we do most of these through mini openings. Uh, for a single level, it's usually a two, two and a half incision. Uh, two level will go up to a four to five inch incision. U.S. experience at this point, there's 507 uh, pro discs placed in the U.S. Uh, the rapidly became the number one disc in the U.S., overtook uh, the Link Charity about uh, a year ago as the number one disc placed. This figure actually is up to 3,000 uh, discs placed, not just European, but worldwide. I'll show you a few of my uh, uh, cases. 
This was my very first case. Uh, she was a 45-year-old police officer. Actually, was a member of the bomb squad at L.A. And, and about four years earlier, I'd done a, a micro disc on her when she returned to, uh, be, to her bomb squad. And they wear these 100-pound suits. And I uh, was a pretty active athletic gal. And about three years later, she developed severe back pain. And, and we had her off work. And she had uh, this disc right here. That's where we did the discectomy. Here was her MRI. That's uh, four years later. Didn't have a recurrent disc, just had this degenerative disc, had a little facet arthritis, but severe back pain from that level. Um, totally legitimate gal, wanted to get back to work. I think normally that would have been a good candidate for some type of fusion. This was our first one for an artificial disc. Here she was, and uh, I was absolutely amazed. She was out of the hospital at two days, uh, was, you know, walking in three days. And again, when you're first experience, you're not sure what to do. I wanted, we had been told to wait three months to get these people going. At about two months, she was out jogging a mile a day, and she's returned to her normal job duties as an LAPD. I didn't want her to go back to wear that 100-pound bomb suit. There's a, and I'll show you another one of an LAPD. There's kind of an unwritten rule in the Los Angeles Police Department. If you've had a fusion, you don't go back to your normal job duties of patrol work in a car. Um, but now with this artificial disc, they don't have a rule with that, and these people have returned to function. So we're getting inundated with law enforcement people who are scheduled for fusions who now realize if they can get an artificial disc, they can go back to work. Uh, she's, this is our longest follow-up. She's almost uh, at two years now. This was the interoperative picture. This actually was the wife of a uh, cardiothoracic surgeon uh, who had had a prior discectomy uh, in San Diego several years earlier, had the very similar disc. And here you can see on flexion extension, this was at six weeks. Let's go back and show you that. See the amount of flexion extension you can uh, occurs with that. And she's been pain free for uh, almost a year and a half now. This was a, another uh, captain in the sheriff's department. Had had a prior discectomy about 10 years earlier. Had a very typical degenerative disc. You can see the osteophytic changes. Uh, severe back pain had been... Uh, relegated to just desk work, wanted to get back actively. I think many of us probably would say that's a pretty good candidate for a fusion, uh, but also had prior surgery, had some facet arthritis. Here you can see in his flexion extension, doesn't have a lot of motion there. Here was his MRI, very degenerative disc, some bulging protrusion, not frank herniation, although we have been doing frank herniations just as easy to take out anteriorly as is in the cervical spine, uh, but that's a pretty typical candidate. And here he is. You can see we've, you're able to restore that height very well. Here he is on flexion, extension, lots of motion there. And he also, I'll show you his bending, his bending uh, video here in a bit. He's returned to uh, work as well. And that's a side bending film. You kind of see what happens to it when they side bend. This is a case uh, that actually has been pretty popular in our area over the past two weeks. This is a, uh, a uh, 41-year-old gal who had double-level disease here, and uh, she had actually quit. Uh, she was a social worker and quit about three years, three years earlier because of her back pain and just said, I'm going to raise my kids. Well, she's a, an elite tennis player in California, and it got to the point where she was unable to take care of her kids, unable to play tennis. She's been treated uh, very conservatively for over a year. Here in uh, is her AP view. I'm not sure in California, pretty. this is called a belly button ring, uh, not part of our implant. I'm not sure whether that's a good prognostic sign or not. Uh, here you can see her two-level disease, very arthritic. We did a two-level on her. This was, I think, the second two-level we did. She's at about six months out. There she is on extension.